Chapter 3. The Rots in the Walls. Part 1. The doctor and Romana stood looking down at K-9 in a cluttered Ealing attic. The doctor's face was frozen in a rictus grin of horror, whilst Romana was rubbing her right temple with the heel of her hand, a weary and pained expression upon her face. K-9 simply sat, wrapped in his scarf of many colours, and whirred and clicked to himself. K-9, Romana began, one eye screwed up against a growing headache. Could you please scan again for the other half of the four-dimensional stress set, the FDSS? Affirmative, mistress. A thought struck Romana. And are you? Negative, mistress. Romana rolled her eyes. Well, please, will you do so now? Affirmative, mistress. The intensity and speed of K-9's chattering increased, and he remained in this state for several seconds. Nothing has changed, mistress, K-9 reported. The other half of the FDSS is not detected. The doctor slumped to the floor to sit cross-legged, his head in his hands. Well, that's that then, he stated morosely. It's over. The universe, I mean. It's over. Everything. Time, space, life, the universe. Everything. The FDSS is not in our fragment of space-time, and there is nothing to be done, except wait for the end. Romana looked down in horror at the doctor, words failing her. K-9 chattered and whirred once more. Negative, master, he said. The doctor bolted forward on all fours and then kneeling, clasped K-9's head in his hands. What? K-9? What do you mean, negative? Can you detect the fragment or not? Negative, master. The doctor moved his head still closer to the robot dog, so he was forehead to forehead with it. K-9, he said slowly. That is a very unhelpful answer. Apologies, master, K-9 responded. But that was an unhelpful question. The doctor paused, frowning. Then he tried again. K-9. Yes, master. Why are you unable to detect the FDSS fragment? If ever an emotion could be read from K-9's various noises or speech, it seemed now almost as if they had acquired a tone of joyous pleasure. The fragment cannot be detected because I lack the resolving power to scan all of this sector of space-time, he reported smartly. Ha! The doctor cried, leaping to his feet once more. Scratch what I said earlier he said, turning to Romana. All is not lost. I may have spoken with too much haste. Romana raised an eyebrow. How unlike you. The doctor showed no signs of detecting the sarcasm. I know, I know, it was quite out of character. It must be this new regeneration settling. I may be a little rough around the edges until it's fully run in, he said, nodding in vigorous agreement. I am sure I shall somehow adjust to your temporary unevenness, Romana assured him. The doctor now turned back to K-9 and snatched him up, gathering him under one arm. The robot now secured, the doctor strode out of the attic, leaving a startled Romana blinking in surprise before rushing to follow him. Doctor, where are you going? She gasped as she caught up to him. Why the TARDIS, of course, he cried cheerfully. Master, I am quite capable of managing the stairs on my own, K-9 chimed, somewhat jerkily, as he was buffeted against the doctor's side. Of course you are the doctor responded, eminently patronizing, while continuing to retain his grip upon the poor device. The doctor barreled through the front door of the house without closing it, down the short length of driveway beyond, straight into the TARDIS itself without a pause. Romana rushed out after him, also leaving the door wide open, and ran into the time ship, dress flying behind her. By now the doctor was at the main console, where he unceremoniously dumped K-9. What element or power source would best suit enhancing your senses, K-9? The doctor now asked. K-9 noisily considered the question for a second. Validium, master. Oh, said the doctor ominously, standing very still. Doctor, what is it? Romana asked. The doctor ignored the question and walked to the main console. He pushed a few buttons lost in thought. Doctor, Romana repeated. The doctor finally looked up. The question is not, what is it, it's where is it, he said quietly, and almost seemed to shiver. All right, Romana said, complying. Where is it? The doctor sighed. Mondas. Romana threw up her hands. What? We can't go there. It will be crawling with Cybermen. The doctor gave a rueful smile. No, it won't. Fortunately, our fragment of space-time does not contain that period of Mondasian history. However, the planet of their origin is the most likely to contain that material which supplies much of their own power. K-9 chirped up. 
Master, I do not recommend going to Mondas, he interjected, almost querulously. The doctor frowned and wagged a finger at K-9. Enough, K-9. I don't want to hear any more about it. My own reluctance was simply born of a basic emotional response based upon my recent experiences with Mondasians. As I said, we shall be visiting a different Mondas, one I visited before, in fact, although it seems sensible to land a century or so beyond my last stopover, just to ensure a slightly higher level of technology and available resources. Have no fear, he said now, looking repeatedly between the faces of Romana and K-9. We shall be perfectly safe. That would make a refreshing change, Romana commented, far from convinced. The sun was about to set over the sprawling and chaotic city of Huktan, de facto capital of Mondas. The mess of streets, threading out from the sluggish river oozing through its heart, looked for all the world like the work of some intoxicated spider. The buildings themselves were a jumble of styles and time periods, many still sporting far more timber and plaster than one might expect for a planet of this level of technology. In many ways the city looked much as it had done for centuries. The streets were, by and large, narrow, and the city showed little desire or respect for open spaces. One building proved an exception to this rule, however. On an island formed by a short fork in the river stood an impressive structure, surrounded by and enclosing a modest amount of lawn. Modest by any other city's standards, that is, but by the measure of Huktan, positively sumptuous. The first narrow band of grass ran between the walled and reinforced side of the island and the three-story quadrangle within. Two bridges connected the island to either side of the rest of the city, ornate and ancient bridges constructed from weathered sandstone blocks. The quadrangle itself was built from this same ruddy material, topped by pitched roofs of black slate, decorated by plentiful crenellations, with gargoyles vying for space along its edges. Within the quadrangle lay the second green space, a true lawn this time, itself surrounding another ancient sandstone structure. This vast vaulted cathedral or chapel-like building was lined with high arched windows. Its roof was pitched like those of the quadrangle, but at a much steeper angle and reached far higher. Indeed, this essentially single-story room was at least as high as all three floors of the surrounding enclosure. However, even this was dwarfed by the twin bell towers attached at either end of the central chamber. Each one straddled massive wooden doors allowing access to the chamber itself. This huge stone edifice, quadrangle, central chamber and towers, comprised a single entity, the Mondasian Parliament. Within the central chamber ran tiers of benches rising five levels high on either side of a wide central aisle. The benches themselves were covered in dyed leather which, while faded by time and use, still bore a striking black-and-white harlequin pattern. At either end of the aisle sat a huge ornate wooden throne, one trimmed entirely in white leather, the other black. The actual walls of the chamber lay behind the high ranks of benches, largely hidden from the rest of the chamber by the wooden wall, forming the backs of the tiers. Starting just below the highest rank, and rising towards the vaulted ceiling, lay the high-arched windows many containing various obscure scenes in stained glass. Beneath these windows, cast into shadow by the benchbacks and separated from this by a narrow walkway, were many alcoves, mostly containing statues. These statues were rarely seen, and even less frequently cleaned, their position lending itself to neglect. Indeed, some of the alcoves were now empty, where a statue had become so degraded by time it had necessitated its removal. It was into one of these empty alcoves the TARDIS now materialized. Inside the TARDIS confusion reigned. What do you mean, no validium detected? came the doctor's indignant tones. Exactly as stated, Master, K-9 replied primly. I detect no sources of validium on Mondas in our space-time fragment. Romana found her eyes rolling once more. K-9, why didn't you tell us that before? she asked. Canine's whirring and chattering somehow conveyed a tone of frustration and irritation. I tried, mistress, Canine exclaimed, but when I began to recommend against coming to Mondas, Master said, Enough! So I desisted. The doctor grabbed his hair in frustration. Canine! Next time we're about to embark on a fool's errand, you have my permission to talk over me. Canine mulled this over for a second. Affirmative, Master. I shall store the instruction in my rapid retrieval memory. 
The doctor frowned and narrowed his eyes at the metal dog, but let the comment slide. Instead, he chose a different line of questioning. K-9, do you detect any sources of validium in our space-time fragment? Affirmative, master, K-9 responded almost cheerfully. What are the coordinates, K-9? Romana asked, moving over to a panel on the main console. Zero, eight, one, four. Romana set the appropriate levers and switches, then threw the launch lever. The TARDIS lurched in several directions at once, screaming and grinding in raucous indignation. It threw the Time Lords off their feet and sent K-9 sliding crazily around the floor, colliding with the occasional obstruction. However, in the wider sense, the TARDIS remained motionless. The disturbance passed, the doctor picked himself up and dusted himself off. I knew there was a reason I preferred to drive. Romana hauled herself up using the edge of the console and cried, It's not my fault! She then caught sight of a view screen, pointed, and with added conviction repeated, Look! It's not my fault! The doctor moved round next to her to investigate. He frowned, tutting. Oh no, this is very bad. Very bad indeed. Romana waved her hand over the display, which seemed for all the world to be riddled with pockmarks and small holes overlaying a representation of their current location. I can see why we're stuck. But what is it? The doctor looked between the display and Romana's face. The universe is disintegrating, he said flatly. Well, yes, Romana said impatiently. I know the universe is fragmented. That's why I'm here. The doctor shook his head. That's not what I mean. Our fragment is disintegrating right here, right now. This would be the fate of the whole of our shattered universe should the pieces drift too far apart, should the damage become irreversible. Romana gasped. Already? Are we already too late? The doctor frowned again, stroking his chin. Hmm, you are right, of course. Romana slumped forward, both palms upon the console for support, utterly dejected. That's that, then, she said wearily. All plans come to naught. We are too late. The doctor shook his head rapidly. No, no, not about that. You were right that it is too soon. Romana looked confused. What do you mean? You almost make it sound like a good thing. Not good, not bad. It simply is, he began, pointing to the monitor. Something has accelerated the process locally, very locally. In fact, I would say restricted to just this building. I dare say if we could move the TARDIS beyond its confines, we would become unstuck and would be free to continue our quest. But the mystery remains. What is hastening the disintegration here? Romana stood up straight once more, looking heartened. What indeed? she agreed. And how can we fix this? Fix? the doctor asked. Who knows if that will even be an option? But whatever the answer, we won't find it in here. The doctor then paused and grinned at Romana. I think it's time we made a parliamentary motion, he declared. The doctor and Romana crept from the TARDIS into the narrow, dim walkway running behind the bench area. They sidled along the towering wooden wall backing the seats towards the end farthest from the occupied throne. From the internal viewers, they already knew that while most of the benches contained parliamentarians clad in white fur robes, only one of the two thrones currently held an incumbent in similar attire. The two Time Lords now turned down the side of the benches, painfully aware that they could no longer remain concealed from everyone, but nevertheless tried to maintain as low a profile as possible. At last they had passed far enough towards the central aisle to catch a glimpse of the enthroned person, albeit through the feet and legs of those seated on one of the higher tiers. Some sort of debate, apparently about price-fixing, was being brought to a close. It was unclear at this stage what price was being fixed, or indeed, if this were a good or bad thing in the eyes of the Assembly. All that could be ascertained was that no decision had been reached and a motion made to continue the following day. A single bell tolling could now be heard, ringing out from one of the towers which bookended the chamber. Almost immediately the bell of the second tower began to chime, out of sync, but in rhythm with the first, but of a lower, darker tone. The figure on the throne stood up. She was clearly the Speaker of the House. She was also quite clearly wearing butcher's garb under her expansive fur cloak, albeit expensively tailored and slightly stylized. As the Doctor and Romana looked around the room, they saw that all the delegates sported professional dress beneath their gowns. Among the more easily recognizable were military outfits, 
plumbers' overalls, builders and farmers, while others were less readily identifiable. The speaker's voice sang out now, clearly reciting a well-worn formal pronouncement. Thus the morning song is sung. All of light must retire. Make way for the dancers of the dark. The tears began to empty now as the members of the assembly slowly filed out through exits either side of the speaker's throne. At this point, Romana and the doctor were startled by a noise immediately behind them. Identical doors had opened at their end of the chamber, one mere meters from where they stood. They felt terribly awkward and exposed as a new troop processed past them to refill the now abandoned benches. This feeling of exposure was heightened further when they noticed the throne above them was also now occupied. A black figure. The night speaker. He glared down at them silently and was clearly displeased by their presence. Like all the newly gathering assembly, he was draped in black fur robes. Beneath these heavy cloaks were also presumably professional clothes, although this was less apparent than with the day assembly, these new outfits being predominantly dark and discreet in nature. It was the gentlemen and ladies of pleasure which most clearly signaled to the Time Lords that this was once again stylized working attire. The benches filled, it was time for the night speaker to make his own formal pronouncement. The daydreamers have awayed to bed. The marks have made way for the marked. It's time now for the night court. Then he turned to stare directly at the doctor and Romana. Interlopers are not welcome in the night parliament. Please retire to the spectators' gallery. Or be carried there. Choose quickly. The doctor nodded once curtly. Much obliged to you, sir, he said before ushering Romana back behind the benches. Together they scuttled along the narrow walkway until they emerged in front of one of the doors through which the day parliament had exited. Quickly they made their own departure. The light was fading fast as the Time Lord stumbled out into the dusk. On the grassy field before them, a few of the day parliament could still be seen in the distance. A small number were heading towards the arches set into the south wing of the quadrangle, allowing access to one of the bridges to the city. Presumably these members were heading home, or to other assignations in the metropolis. Many more were heading into various doors set into the east wing, no doubt to work or refresh themselves in their private quarters, or even to sleep. One member, however, seemed to be actively dawdling and was not far from the doctor and Romana. Indeed, her furtive glances in their direction seemed to invite their approach. The Time Lords looked at one another and decided to oblige. Good evening, respected member. May we join you? The doctor asked, as he and Romana briskly strode up to the day speaker. The day speaker smiled kindly and nodded. Hello to you both, she said in friendly but hushed tones. I would very much like to speak with you, off-worlders as you most obviously are, but follow me discreetly and come to my chambers. It would not look good for me to be talking openly to you out here like this. As she said this, all three noticed another representative of the day parliament had subtly moved closer. He was tall and seemed to be wearing a lab coat and smart dungarees, replete with various electrical devices. In arch tones overlaid with insincere good humor, he said, Ah, Jian, seeking to forge off-world alliances, are we? You just can't help trying to recapture past glories, can you? He finished by shaking his head, tutting and chuckling. Well met, Seaman. Jian replied with nervous, forced jollity. No such thing, merely giving these fine tourist directions. Good day to you all. As the day speaker turned back towards the east wing, she hissed under her breath. Corridor 2, room 23. Then she bustled off towards the quadrangle at some speed. Seaman gave a watery smile and a perfunctory bow to Romana and the doctor, then did the same, though at a more leisurely pace. Ooh, intrigue. Romana said to the doctor behind her hand. This time it was the doctor's turn to roll his eyes. I do so hate politics, he said impatiently. Then he looked pointedly at Romana. Of course, some take to it more easily than others. Romana laughed. You're a fine one to talk. You were the president of the Supreme Council of Gallifrey, long before I was. Not that long before, the doctor conceded grumpily. Then he looked unsure. Actually, technically, I think I might still be, he mused. Romana shook her head. No, trust me, they removed you. I witnessed the proceedings. The doctor held up a finger. Ah, but in my absence. 
I never filled out the forms, dotted the T's, crossed the I's, signed on the dotty line. I'm not sure it was entirely legal. Romana shook her head again. We changed the law. It's legal. The doctor pouted. That's cheating, he declared huffily before stuffing his hands into his trouser pockets and ambling off towards the east wing. Romana sighed and followed him. The doctor disappeared through one of the larger doorways leading into the building, and Romana briskly followed suit. She found the doctor standing stock still in the center of a corridor, perhaps thirty meters long. It appeared to be entirely empty, barring the doctor, and now Romana, and yet he was staring with intense focus along its length. There was a painting on the wall at that end, and yet the doctor's eyes did not seem fixed on any part of it. Doctor, what is it? What can you see? Romana asked. We have a visitor, the doctor explained quietly, nodding downwards. Romana stared again, this time focusing on the line where the wall met the floor. Finally she saw it, a black outline, roughly the size and shape of an earth rat, but with something slightly off about it. An alien creature. I've always found them fascinating. Shall we get a closer look? Romana asked excitedly. Have you? the doctor asked somewhat skeptically. Well, in any case, I think you'll find it's a rat. Romana frowned and looked a little disappointed. Oh, well, we could still go over and say hello. The doctor stroked his chin. Yes, now you mention it, it might well bear closer inspection. Together, they began to walk slowly and calmly towards the creature crouching there. Just as they had covered roughly half the distance, Romana stopped dead and grabbed the doctor's arm. Doctor, look at its back. The segments, something has been done to it. What Romana had attempted to describe might well indeed subvert human expectations. The creature was black and apparently furred, but while its head, tail and legs were very rat-like, its body had many armoured plates running across its back. These overlapped one another from just behind the head to the base of the tail, much like those of an armadillo. Unlike an armadillo, these plates seemed to lie beneath the black furred skin. The doctor looked at Romana. This is a Mondasian rat. The plates are perfectly normal. That is not the problem. Oh, Romana said with slight embarrassment. Then the doctor's final statement registered with her. But there is a problem. The doctor nodded and pointed to a stained glass window in the wall to the left of them. Although there was little light left outside, the interior lamps illuminated the picture well enough. The scene appeared to be some obscure religious ritual, with hooded monk-like figures surrounding what looked like a tree, albeit one without leaves and whose branches looked particularly tubular, terminating in curious paddles. However, it was one detail in the bottom left corner to which the doctor was directing Romana's attention, an artist's conceit, the stylized figure of a rat watching. Although somewhat simplistic in its rendering, this grey image was clearly the same species as the animal before them, plates and all. They look very similar. What's the problem? There are no black rats on Mondas. The doctor's reply was far more ominous in tone than the words alone seemed to warrant. A noise now drifted to them from the end of the corridor. While it clearly emanated from the rat, it was a most disturbing and incongruous sound. It sounded for all the world like a child laughing. They don't giggle either, the doctor noted. Romana seemed transfixed by the creature now and without waiting for the doctor began to walk toward it once more. The doctor regarded both of them for a moment, unmoving, before following her down the corridor, trailing by a few meters. The rat seemed utterly unperturbed by Romana's approach. A rat's face is far from the ideal vehicle to convey emotion, but it seemed to be grinning, while fitful chuckles still sporadically broke forth. Romana knelt before it and extended her hand. Romana! The doctor hissed warningly. Romana seemed completely oblivious to the doctor as her hand reached out and touched the rat. Immediately Romana tipped back on her heels, unbalanced and falling. The doctor rushed in behind her, dropping to one knee to catch her in his arms and prevent her head colliding with the cold, hard stone floor. At the same time the rat screeched with laughter and ran off along the side of the wall to disappear. The doctor looked at Romana's face in horror. Her eyes had rolled up into her head, and she lolled like a marionette with its strings cut. Ulu thikva umeruth zoar heb, she cried unintelligibly. 
The doctor shook her carefully but firmly, saying, Romana, it's the doctor. Come back to me. Romana's eyes rolled round to fix upon his face. The doctor? Why? She yelled, her body stiff, still clearly not herself. Then she relaxed in his arms as her senses fully returned. I'm sorry, doctor, she said serenely, smiling sweetly. I have no idea what came over me. The doctor's concern gave way to irritation as he now stood and helped her to her feet. I can't believe you went ahead and touched it. I'm surprised you didn't just lick it. Romana bristled for a moment at the admonishment before deciding to put on a more humorous face. Don't be ridiculous, doctor. Licking it would have been the second phase. The doctor pulled a face. Naturally. Anyway, what did you learn by your prodding? As Romana's thoughts turned back to the encounter, her face dropped and became more ashen. I don't know, she began hesitantly. I mean, I'm not sure. I don't think I was here anymore, at least not in my mind. It was like a dream world, yet not like any nightmare or vision I have had before. Nothing was clear, everything was jumbled. It all seemed too much. Too much space, too many directions, too many colors, sounds. Ah. Romana paused here, clutching her head. Then she continued slowly with her eyes scrunched up. Too many possibilities, all happening at the same time. I do not know what I saw. The doctor put a hand on her shoulder. It is fortunate you were only in contact with that thing for a moment. It gave you a glimpse into the bulk, if only for a split second. I doubt even our Time Lord minds could have withstood a more sustained exposure. Romana looked at the doctor in an almost challenging way. Perhaps you are right, although it may be you underestimate the power of a Time Lord mind, at least with sufficient time and training anyway. The doctor shrugged. This is all getting needlessly academic. We need to find that thing. Now, where did it go? The doctor's question trailed off as he examined the line between floor and wall where the rat had appeared to run. The direction of its flight led to the corner of the corridor, and no obvious means of escape. Curiouser and curiouser, the doctor muttered to himself. We should have brought K-9 along. He's a good ratter. Doctor, look, Romana said and pointed to a tiny crack in the skirting board no more than a quarter of an inch wide. Then she shook her head, tutting. Just ignore me, doctor. Obviously there is no way it could have fitted through there. The doctor raised his eyebrows and spread his hands, gesturing along the otherwise unbroken skirting. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth, he said with stoic resignation. But that's also impossible, Romana cried, pointing at the crack. The doctor gave her a hard stare. Not for what we just witnessed, he began gravely. While that may once have been a simple rat, it is a rat no longer. It is something far greater and far more dangerous, and it is no respecter of our measure of the impossible. Romana shuddered. So what now? The doctor pulled himself up to his full height. Now we have an appointment to keep, so let us away to— Here he paused, losing momentum. Corridor 2, room 23. Romana supplied helpfully. Exactly, the doctor exclaimed enthusiastically before spinning on his heels to stride off along the corridor. He then stopped and looked back over his shoulder at the other Time Lord. And, Romana, the doctor said, yes, doctor, try not to lick anything.
Masters, mistresses, the doctor requires materials in order to maintain the TARDIS and ensure continued functionality. He similarly requires carbon-based comestibles to sustain his own biological functions and existence. Master would never say this, but he requires aid beyond that supplied by this unit in order to acquire these. To aid the doctor in his various tasks and creations, this can be most effectively achieved via Patreon or Substack subscriptions, or through donations directly to PayPal, or if you desire physical goods in return for your contributions, written accounts of my travels with the Doctor are also available on Amazon. Links are in the description below. Thank you, Masters, Mistresses.